Hello, and thanks for coming to my talk. Today I'd like to tell you about a millennia old geometric puzzle, as well as its modern reincarnation, applications and approaches. First, I'm going to give some historical context and motivation for Dido's problem and the isoparametric ratio. Then I'll show how its drawbacks lead naturally to the isoparametric profile. I'll review some existing approaches to bounding and computing the profile, and then I'll describe our new method, which computes significantly tighter bounds, as well as the exact profile under certain assumptions. And I'll end with a brief discussion of what's left. Starting in 814 BC, King Tyre died and left his country to his two heirs, Pygmalion and Dido. Pygmalion took the throne for himself, leaving Dido to sail away, looking for her own land to rule. Eventually landing somewhere on the coast of North Africa, where she meets King Larbus. King Larbus offers to sell her some land, but instead of saying exactly how much land, he presents her with a geometric puzzle, as was common back then. He offers her as much land as will fit within one bull's hide. So Dido takes her bull's hide and cuts it into strips of total length p meters. And now she has the following puzzle to solve. Given p meters of bull hide, how do you bind the biggest country? This is now known as Dido's problem. What shape of fixed perimeter p has maximal area? Back in 800 BC, this was an open problem, perhaps explaining Dido's puzzled expression. Fast forward to the 1900s, Various proofs of the isoparametric inequality came out, definitively solving Dido's problem with a perfect circle. With a slight modification of the isoparametric inequality, you get the isoparametric ratio, which measures how far a shape is from being a perfect circle. In political science, this ratio is widely used and known as the polsby popper score. There, it is used as a measurement of geometric complexity, with low scores being more complex and high scores being less complex. Geometric complexity in this setting is sometimes stigmatized as an indication of political malice. Recent work, however, shows that this score only actually indicates the resolution you downloaded your map at. Here we see that if you download maps of coarser resolution, your isoparametric ratio increases dramatically. In this more extreme example, we have a perfect circle with a score of one and a slight boundary perturbation of the circle with a score that's almost zero. And on the isoparametric ratio scale, there are various shapes between them. This shows again that the isoparametric ratio is far too sensitive to boundary perturbations and is not fit to generally describe geometric complexity. In comes the isoparametric profile, which says that instead of measuring geometric complexity with just one number, you should measure it with an entire profile. This captures the complexity of a shape at multiple resolutions. To define the isoparametric profile more, more formally, let's consider Dido's problem again and add the following extra constraint. Now Dido needs to find a shape of fixed perimeter with maximal area, and that shape must be contained inside some subset. Essentially, you could imagine that King Larbus only owns a limited region of land and cannot give any more than that to Dido. So Dido needs to choose among shapes that are a subset of the purple star. Note that for most fixed perimeter values, the solution is not a perfect circle anymore because that's an invalid solution. In fact, the right answer in this case is this. However, for general domains, this problem remains difficult to solve today, and so Dido remains perplexed. To get the isoparametric profile, we need one more modification, which is to swap the perimeter and area. Now we are looking for the minimal perimeter domain of fixed area that is inscribed in an outer domain. Solving this problem for one fixed area gives you a single point of the isoparametric profile. We will also denote the shape that solves this problem as the minimal perimeter subdomain, E. This is the modern version of Dido's problem and remains the subject of active research. While no modern algorithm is known to solve it, there is recent work that can lower bound it. 
In 2019, DeFord et al. proposed a total variation-based algorithm that computes the lower convex envelope of the isoparametric profile. In this example, the red curve is the profile for the red shape, and the blue curve is what can be computed using the lower bound. While this is a nice step, it doesn't allow us to compute the exact profile. If we focus our attention, however, on a specific class of domains, those with no necks, then it is possible to compute the exact isoparametric profile. A domain has no necks of radius r if for any two balls of the same radius inside the domain, there exists a path by which you can move one ball to the other. Put more visually, consider the following shapes. The hourglass on the left, which has a neck, and the star on the right with no neck. On the hourglass, there is no way to move the two balls to each other, so it has a neck. On the star, any two balls at the same radius can be moved to each other, so it has no neck. This result says that if a shape has no necks, like the star, then the morphological opening with a ball is the minimal perimeter subdomain. The morphological opening with a ball of radius r is the union of all balls of that radius that fit inside the domain. This is depicted by the blobby yellow pentagon. If the radius of the ball decreases, the morphological opening increases. So if you want to compute the isoparametric profile of a shape with no neck, such as the star, you can just take the morphological opening of it with balls of decreasing radius and plot their perimeters against their areas. This is the isoparametric profile of the star. The circle and perturbed circles also have no necks, so we can compute their profiles exactly. This example demonstrates the ability of the isoparametric profile to measure multi-resolution complexity. You can see that at coarse resolutions, both domains are identical, while at higher resolutions, they differ drastically. So to summarize, previous work allows us to compute the isoparametric profile if the domain has no necks. It also allows us to compute convex lower envelopes to the profile. In our work, we provide the upper bound counterpart to the profile. Furthermore, we show that for a class of domains satisfying the thick neck criteria, our bound is tight. To describe our algorithm, we'll need to first do a quick intro to the medial axis transform. Consider the projection operation that takes as input points on the interior of the domain, shown in red, and outputs the closest boundary point, shown in blue. The medial axis is then the set of interior points at which the projection is discontinuous. In other words, where, they may be, where there may be multiple closest boundary points. If you take all such points, it forms a one-dimensional skeleton shown in purple and yellow. We say the radius function of a point on the medial axis is its distance to the boundary. The medial axis transform is the combination of the medial axis with its radius function. We can now define the limited reconstruction from a subset of the medial axis. Let G be a subset of points of the medial axis shown in green. Then the limited reconstruction is the union of balls centered on those points of the associated radius. In this example, the limited reconstruction is the union of all the purple balls. As you increase the number of points in G, the limited reconstruction begins to approach the original domain. Maybe you're thinking the medial axis and limited reconstructions don't seem to have anything to do with the isoparametric profile. In fact, they are related through the morphological opening. If you choose G to be the subset of medial axis points whose radii are larger than a threshold rho, then the limited reconstruction is exactly the morphological opening of that domain with a ball of radius rho. This means that it is possible to compute the isometric isoparametric profile of a no-neck domain by using limited reconstructions. The intuition to keep in mind here is that constructing minimal perimeter subdomains seems to involve subsets of the medial axis with the largest radius. This observation leads to our algorithm. Our algorithm is as follows. 
start by initializing G to the single point in the medial axis with maximum radius, then greedily absorb neighboring vertices on the medial axis of largest radius while repeatedly performing reconstructions. Note that for domains with necks, our algorithm does not produce the morphological opening anymore, and the reconstruction is not guaranteed to be perimeter minimizing. However, it is still an upper bound to the actual minimal perimeter subdomain. Continuing this procedure until the full domain is reconstructed produces our upper bound to the isoparametric profile. For comparison, we show here the isoparametric profile upper bound computed by morphological opening alone. Note that it is much looser than our upper bound, particularly when the domain has necks. Finally, we show the convex lower envelope of the profile in red. Combining these upper and lower bounds shows us that the isoparametric profile is guaranteed to lie within a very narrow range. In this example, we computed bounds on the isoparametric profile of Mozambique. Due to Mozambique's odd shape, it has several necks. This results in the morphological opening producing generally worse upper bounds than our method. Combined with the lower convex envelope bound, we have a reasonably narrow region inside which the isoparametric profile must lie. Here's our method applied to an actual district in Arkansas, US. Again, you can see that the morphological opening doesn't work as well in the presence of necks. There are a few exceptions, however, where morphological opening seems to produce tighter bounds than our medial axis-based approach. Combining both upper bounds with the total variation lower bound, we again significantly narrow down the location of the isoparametric profile. Lastly, note that the isoparametric profile curves upwards dramatically towards the end. This indicates that on this district, there is a fairly simple coarse representation with a dramatic increase in complexity towards higher resolutions. I'd like to move on to discuss a more theoretical result about our algorithm. We've already seen that when a domain has no neck, it's possible to compute the profile. One might hope that even if the domain has a neck, but that neck is large enough, then we can still compute its profile. To formalize this idea, we'll need some definitions. We'll define the second largest radius as the radius of the second largest ball that can fit inside a domain. This is illustrated by the smaller pink circle at the bottom of the worm. Next, we'll define the smallest neck as the radius of the smallest pair of balls that cannot be continuously moved to each other. This is indicated by half the length of the dotted line. Finally, we'll say that a domain satisfies the thick neck criteria if its smallest neck is thicker than half its second largest radius. It should come as no surprise that the worm domain is a thick neck domain, which is why we used it for vis visualization. Our result is that if a domain satisfies the thick neck criteria, then our isoparametric profile upper bound is tight. This means that in practice, for thick neck domains like this worm, we can compute the exact profile. I'll provide some intuition for why this might be the case. But before I do that, let me address the fact that the total variation lower bound appears to sometimes be above both the upper bounds. This is entirely due to discretization error of total variation. Finding a good discretization of total variation is still the subject of ongoing research and can result in slight error in the lower bound. Okay, back to the upper bounds. I'd like to point your attention to the fact that the two candidate subdomains differ in connectedness. By construction, our subdomain will always be connected. In contrast, the morphological opening will often prefer a disconnected subdomain in the presence of necks. 
Disconnectedness costs a large amount of extra perimeter, making it usually the non-optimal solution, and the thick neck criteria is the condition under which the optimal subdomain always prefers to be connected. Okay, I'd like to show one more example of a thick neck domain called the jellyfish. Again, you can see the morphological opening constructs subdomains that are disconnected, forcing it to pay extra perimeter. Our method maintains a connected subdomain, allowing it to use minimal perimeter. One more thing about the jellyfish domain that I find fascinating is this region of the profile. This is where the profile suddenly changes slope, indicating a transition to higher complexity. And in this case, it's completely intuitive why there's a sudden change. This corresponds to exactly where the subdomains start to include tentacles of the jellyfish. So you can really see at what resolution a domain starts to get more complex. To summarize, in this work, we provide the upper bound counterpart to the total variation lower bound. Our bound is tight for thick neck domains. Our bound is empirically often better than the upper bound computed by morphological opening. And when all three bounds are combined, this produces extremely tight bounds on the isoparametric profile. If you put it all together, you can obtain profiles and bounds on profiles for a large variety of shapes. Here we've scaled the areas so that all the profiles lie on the same axis. This lets us compare point-wise between different shapes to see just how complex they are. The isoparametric profile has never previously been as easily obtainable or boundable as it is now. This enables use of the isoparametric profile for a variety of potential applications. For example, the profile could be used as a new shape descriptor. Consider the, consider the two green shapes on the right. These are infamous for the fact that they have identical spectra and so are intrinsically identical. However, the radius of the maximum inscribed circle inside them are different. This means that the isoparametric profile can distinguish between the two while their spectra could not. If you're worried that the gap in the upper and lower bounds would ruin its adoption in any applications, I would argue that as a shape descriptor, the upper and lower bounds are themselves already good things to use. They are rotation and translation invariant and can be scaled by area to share the same axes across different shapes. So acquiring the exact profile at this point is not strictly necessary. Another application could be towards quantifying the entropy of a shape. Geometric complexity and entropy are similar concepts, so I imagine you could use the profile to see how much of a geometry you're willing to lose if you're only willing to spend so many bits of memory to encode it. Through this, one could also compress a shape into a more compact form. An obvious extension of this work is, of course, bringing it to 3D. A naive extension would easily produce upper bounds to the profile at the cost of computing the medial surface. The 3D setting is more complex, however, since area minimizing surfaces are not necessarily spherical anymore. Some form of nonlinear optimization could be done to further tighten these bounds. Lastly, we have this conjecture for the 2D setting that we didn't manage to prove, but we haven't found any counterexamples for either, which is that the minimal perimeter subdomain can always be described as a union of balls centered on the medial axis. Proof of this would reduce the problem definitively from 2D to just 1D. I encourage anyone to try our method out. We are actively adding new features and experiments to the code base, so it may change over time, but the base functionality will remain the same. Thank you for listening.